Open your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 6. If you were in this service uh, last week, we were reminded of why it's so important to have our Bibles with us. Uh, the slides did not work last, last week. I, I need to say that was my fault. Uh, I gave the tech team the wrong slides. I greatly appreciate the, our tech team and the, the superb job they do for us, but uh, I got to be on my game and make sure I get them the right slides. But it's a good reminder, is it not, uh, that even though it's nice to have these screens and to be able to put the scripture up on the screens, to have our Bibles with us, whether printed or on an electronic device, uh, I'm reminded of the Bereans in Acts chapter 17. We're told uh, in Acts 17 that the Bereans, when they heard Paul preach, they received his preaching with great joy and they examined the scriptures closely themselves to see if what he was saying as he preached was true. And I, I challenge you to do that as we work through even Nehemiah 6 today. For anybody who is up here uh, preaching the word to you, that you follow along and you examine the scriptures to see if what is being said is true. Chapter 6 of Nehemiah, as we've worked our way up to that, I'm not going to do any review today. But um, really what uh, strikes me about chapter 6 is this phrase in verse 3, I am engaged in a great work. Now, now I'm going to put that in context in just a moment, but uh, what is it that Nehemiah is talking about? For, for him, that particular great work was rebuilding Jerusalem's wall. Uh, that, that, that was not the entirety of the work, but that was the next step. That was the vision of what is the next step to accomplish towards the bigger picture of glorifying God's name and of, of, of reaching out to God's people. So, so for Nehemiah, uh, just, just consider this. If you've been with us through this series, or, or even if you haven't, but you know a little bit about the story of Nehemiah, Consider the contrast between what he is saying now is a great work and what he was doing when Nehemiah opened. In Nehemiah chapter 1, where is he? He is in the palace of the king of Persia. That was the biggest, most powerful empire on the earth at that time in world history. He was in Susa, this beautiful summer capital of, of the, uh, the Persian empire, he was, uh, he was a trusted advisor of the king. He had the king's ear. He, he had some control, even probably over who had access to the king. You couldn't have had a more politically powerful position than Nehemiah had, especially as a Jewish exile. Contrast that and all that power. It is, it wouldn't, wouldn't the world say at that time, that's where your great work is, Nehemiah? That's where your great work is. It's influencing the Persian throne. It's in that palace. It's in that capital of the Persian Empire. Contrast that with where he is when he says this now. He is in the backwaters of the Persian Empire. He is in this small province, Judah, that's populated by just several thousand Jewish exiles and he's in Jerusalem, which is basically a city that is in rubble. And whereas he had served in the palace of the king and been dressed in fine robes and had conversations with the king and the other leaders in the palace, now he spends his days moving blocks of stone. Now he spends his days getting dusty and dirty and sweaty. And yet he says, this is the great work. In the eyes of the world, what he was doing in Susa was great work. In the eyes of the world, what he's doing now in Jerusalem, rebuilding this wall, it's insignificant. It's labor that doesn't even matter. But Nehemiah knows what really is the definition of great work. Great work is the work that God has called him to do to build God's kingdom. And that eclipses anything else, no matter what the world thinks of it. Now let me, let me take that to us before we even get into the story today. 
Uh, I want to tell you this morning that if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, whether you know it or not, you are engaged in a great work. You are engaged in a, a great work. Now again, if you measure that by the world standards, if you measure what is greatness, what is it to do a great work, if you measure that by what you see on Instagram or Facebook or what you read in Twitter or some other online media, you get a vastly different picture of what is great work, do you not? Or if you measure a great work by the financial income that it affords you, or the kind of neighborhood that you can live in because of what you do, or the parties that you can attend <clears throat> because of the access that your position has. That, that gives you a, a very different, and I would say a skewed view of what a great work is. But what if you used our mission statement, which is drawn from Jesus' words in the Great Commission, Matthew chapter 28. What if you used our mission statement like, like Nehemiah uses the, the call to rebuild the wall? What if for you, you hear the call, come, let's make disciples of Jesus who live out passion for Christ and compassion for people? What if you begin to let that define what is a great work in your life? Think about that as that might work out in your life. Husbands, wives, the great work that you have to do before you is encouraging your spouse, praying with them, encouraging them with a the word. Parents, the great work that is before you is to lead your children into the Scriptures, to introduce them to Jesus to help them come to know Him and how it is that they speak and relate with God and how to come to a true saving faith. That's the great work before you. And as you come into the body of Christ, think of even what is happening outside this room right this morning. There are people doing great work in our early childhood classrooms. There are people doing great work as they work with our children in Sunday schools. Why? Because they are teaching them what it means to become a follower of Jesus Christ, a disciple of Jesus Christ, who lives out passion for Christ and compassion for people. Think of what happens here on Wednesday nights. Those of you who work with our youth, and as you introduce our youth to what it means to follow Jesus faithfully, to love people, to demonstrate compassion in Jesus' name to people. You are engaged in a great work. Think of the other ministries that Calvary is involved with that takes us out into the world. Our refugee care ministry. Our compassion counseling center. You could add to that list, I'm sure. When we reach out to people in Jesus' name, demonstrating passion for Christ and compassion for people, when we draw people to become followers of Jesus, we are engaged in a truly great work. Think of the recent BLESS campaign that we did. What it, does it mean to, to build that relationship with your neighbors and your coworkers, ultimately that you might share Christ with them? That is a great work. All of these things that I've just listed and, and many more, the world looks at these. You don't see these showing up on Instagram or Facebook. The world looks at these and says they're insignificant. They really don't matter. They certainly aren't a measure of greatness. But if greatness is judged by eternal results, as, as we get the indication here in Nehemiah 6 it is, you are engaged in a great work. And so, as we, we embrace that, as we take up that challenge to be engaged in the great work in whatever sphere that God has put us in, in whatever way that we can serve in Christ's body, one of the things that we encounter, the same thing that Nehemiah encountered here, is we have an enemy. We have an enemy, Satan, the devil, who wants to oppose us, who does not want us involved in that great work. John calls him the father of lies. He's the one who starts that lie that it really doesn't matter if you pray with your wife. It really doesn't matter if you talk to your kids about Jesus. It really doesn't matter if you serve in the local church. Those, aren't insig those are insignificant. Those, those don't count for anything. That's not what greatness is. And the father of lies will seek to convince you that 
what you're doing and all of those efforts, what you're doing as a single person to stay pure and, and follow Jesus even in your singleness, what you're doing as a parent, what you're doing as a Christian spouse, what you're doing in your service in the church, it's meaningless, it's pointless, you might as well just give it up. He's seeking to keep you from persevering and what truly, eternally, will be seen to be a great work. And what we see in chapter 6 is we see three ways. The outline's very simple this morning. We see in chapter 6 three ways that our enemy would seek to hinder us from being engaged in that great work. Or you might think of your great work in, in the, the metaphor of the story of Nehemiah. The enemy wants to get you off the wall. The enemy wants, to, wants you to stop your work on the wall, whatever that may be, in your marriage, and in, with your kids, in your service in the church, wherever it may be, the, the enemy wants you to lay down that work on the wall. And there are three ways. There are not only three ways, but there are three ways that we see in the story of Nehemiah 6 that he seeks to do that. And the first one is distractions and divisions. We see this uh, in, in what's happening with Nehemiah in chapter 6. We're told that at this point the wall is almost finished. And at, at the only thing that really needs to be done to complete the wall, remember two miles, almost two miles of wall, 40 different sections. This wall is up to nine feet thick. And these people, these common ordinary people in groups of families and, and groups of vocations, have, have almost completed this wall. The only thing we read in verse 1 that has yet to be done is the doors, the gates, have to be set in place with, uh, in the wall. And uh, the enemies, the, the, those who are opposing the rebuilding of the wall and the surrounding provinces, they, they see that this is reality. They see that, that Nehemiah has progressed in this project far beyond their expectations and they become extremely concerned. They know that this is their last opportunity. Uh, we read in verse 1, Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem, and the rest of the enemies found out that they had almost finished rebuilding the wall. How, did, how was it that the enemies who weren't there in Jerusalem found out that this wall was almost complete? I'm not going to put it up on the screen, but if you have your Bible, you can look down to verses 17, 18, and 19, and that really tells us. Verse 17 says that the nobles of Judah, these are Jews in Jerusalem, they sent letters to, Deba to Tobiah, one of these leaders of the enemies, and Tobiah was sending letters to them. Why was this correspondence going back and forth? We're told in verse 18, many in Judah were bound by oath to him. What that's saying is they had ties of loyalty. Why did they have ties of loyalty? Because there had been intermarriage between the Jews who had returned and people in the surrounding provinces. In fact, verse 18 tells us that Tobiah's father-in-law was Shechaniah. He is, we're told in Ezra 8, he's a, he's a leader of, of, uh, of, the, of some of the great families that had returned. He is what's called a leading man. Uh, we're also told that Tobiah's son had married the daughter of Mishalem, another leading man. So these nobles, these heads of these families, had, had inner ties of intermarriage with, with the Samaritans and, and the Ammonites and the other enemies in the provinces around Judah. And because of those ties, there were ties of loyalty, and they communicated back and forth. So verse 19 tells us that these nobles... Uh, they communicated with Tobiah, and then they kept talking about Tobiah and how good he was to Nehemiah. They were lobbying with Nehemiah, and they reported Nehemiah's words to Tobiah. I, we could call that probably espionage. We could call that spying. So that's the situation. The enemies find out that this project is progressing far beyond their expectations of time, and in verse 2, we see their first attempt. We see the attempt of distraction and diversion. What they want to do is get Nehemiah off the wall. They want to get Nehemiah to stop this work that he is doing. If they can stop Nehemiah in his tracks, if they can take him out, ideally, they can perhaps prevent 
those gates from being put in place, they still have an opportunity then to get in and kill the workers and stop the project. How do they do this? Verse 2 tells us they ask him, they ask Nehemiah to meet them in one of the villages on the plain of Ono. Now, you can can look at a map later, but basically what this is, this is about 25 miles away from Jerusalem. It is up near the border of Samaria, so it's almost out of Jewish territory. We could think of it as really a no-man's land. And, And not only is it out of Jewish or almost out of Jewish territory, not only is it near where one of their enemies, the Samaritans, were, a dangerous place, it's a long distance by foot travel, which Nehemiah would have had, that would have been his mode of travel. It would have taken him two days each way uh, to, to, to travel there and meet with them, probably would have taken another day and then two days to come back. That is five days that the work would have ceased on the wall. So if Nehemiah had accepted this invitation, they could have shut down the work for almost a week. And he would have been many miles away from Jerusalem. He would have been in a vulnerable position. That really was their intent, as we see, is they want to get him far away, and then they want to eliminate him. They want to assassinate him. But Jerusalem would have been vulnerable without their leader as well. But Nehemiah refuses because he realizes what their true motives are. They were plotting to harm them. He knew what their real intentions were. And so, verse 3 gives us his reply, and here's where our, our key uh, phrase from, for the sermon today comes from. I replied by sending this message to them, I am engaged in a great work, so I can't come down. Why should I stop working to come and meet with you? He turned them down, even though he knew what their real motive was, he doesn't go there and, and, and say, I know you're trying to take me out. Instead, he He states what his priority is. His priority, his first priority, is set by the mission that God has given to him. His priority was the work that God had entrusted to him, rebuilding the wall as the next step of fulfilling that vision. Now, now you and I, in a situation like that, you know, we we may have uh, been tempted to want to somehow appease these men. Oh, really, they they just want to come to some understanding. I don't like the tension that exists between us and them, so yeah, maybe it's worth it to lay that work aside for a time and go and meet with them. You know, that raises up that, that, um, that conflict between what the Bible calls the fear of man and the fear of God. You know, we're called to fear God. We're called to revere Him. We're called to put His will first. And yet we're tempted as human beings to fear man, to fear people. Fear in the sense of, oh, I want to keep them happy. I want to appease them. I don't want them mad at me in some way. So that was the dilemma that, that we all face, the very real human dilemma that we all face on a regular basis, fearing God versus fearing man. That was the dilemma that, that Nehemiah faced here, and yet he put the fear of man in its proper place, under the fear of God. He put the priority that God had given to him first. Verse 4 tells us that they repeated this, uh, this ruse four more times. You know, probably each time they sent a letter, it became a little louder. It became uh, a little more urgent, a little more stronger. But he turned them down all four times. He didn't leave the wall. He kept working on the wall. He kept his focus on what God had called him to do. You know, think about this as it applies to you, as it applies to you and the great work that God has put before you. Again, whether whatever sphere that's in, in your marriage, in your home, where you work, where you serve at the church, that great work of what it means in whatever way, even the ways that seem insignificant to you and certainly to the world, whatever way that that you attempt to make disciples, to help people come to know Jesus and begin to follow Jesus. Your enemy, our enemy, wants to distract you from doing that. He wants to divert you from doing that in whatever way he can. Uh, he'll, he'll distract you. He will, he will seek to, um, uh, to, to draw you into, you know, may, maybe it's the use of your time. 
Maybe he'll distract you with something good. You're involved in, in certain recreational activities, and there's nothing wrong with those activities, but he'll get you more and more involved with them, and they'll take more and more time from you. And, and that's a distraction. Anything, even a good thing, that would make you set aside your efforts and your sphere that he has called you, the place he's put you on the wall to make disciples of Jesus, even good things that distract you from it, are part of our enemy's ploy to get you off the wall. Or, or he'll divert you. If he can't distract you with, with uh, your media consumption or your recreational activities or your use of time in some other way, he'll seek to divert you. He'll, he'll tempt you to make gradual compromises. Well, I really don't need to pray with my spouse. Yeah, you know, I, I don't need to worry about reading the Bible with my kids. Isn't that what the, they're supposed to do at church? Uh, I, I really don't need to, uh, to, to take my Christianity into my workplace. I mean, that, that's, that's not the proper place for it. He will, he will attempt to tempt you, to draw you into making subtle compromises. That's a diversion. Or he will outright entice you to sin. Just as, just as Sanballat and Tobiah sought to draw Nehemiah out to a place would have put him in a very vulnerable place. He'll seek to uh, entice you to go places that you shouldn't be, where, where you are exposed to things that particularly tempt you. And all of this is an attempt to divert you, because if he can divert you, if he can get you off the wall, he can take you out of the game of making disciples. So, so I would encourage you, use verse 3, use, use what Nehemiah says here. I am engaged in a great work. I am engaged in a great work, so I can't let sports control my life. I can't be out every day of the week, every night of the week playing sports, because that'll take me off the wall. I'm engaged in a great work, so I can't binge on Netflix. That's a use of time that takes me away from what I should be doing in my marriage, or with my kids, or with my Christian friends. I'm engaged in great work, so I can't travel so much. Yeah, travel's a good thing, but if I'm away from the body of Christ more weeks of the month and I'm, I'm there, that takes me off the wall. I'm engaged in a great work, so I can't date that unbeliever. Yeah, they seem like a really good person, but in dating an unbeliever and, and the compromises that may cause me to make and even entering into a marriage with an unbeliever, that's going to take me off the wall. That's going to divert me from the work that God has called me to do. I'm engaged in a great work, so I can't go to that party. I know that'll put me in a vulnerable place. I know that I'll tend to be enticed into sin if I go to that party. I'm engaged in a great work, so I can't look at pornography. Yeah, it's all around and it pops up all the time on, on the internet, but I can't go there. I, I've got to put restraints in place and guards in place so that doesn't distract me, so that doesn't divert me, so I can stay on the wall. So I can stay engaged in the great work that God has entrusted me with. Anything that pulls you away from your great work on the wall of making disciples in your marriage and in your family and in the spheres that God has opened to you, perhaps through Calvary's ministries here, anything that would divert you, anything that would take you off the wall in any way is Satan's ploy, just as we see him doing here, to hinder you from that great work. If Satan can't take you off the wall through distractions and diversions, he will seek to use gossip and slander. And that's what we see here. Verse 5, we see that they, they amp it up, Tobiah and Sam Ballot. And now they send an open letter. Uh, letters were, like our letters today, customarily sealed, so only the recipient can open it and read it. An open letter, which was an anomaly in those days, is a letter that's not sealed, you know, not in an envelope, so to speak. So what does that mean? Every person that that letter is passed to on its trip to reach its recipient reads it. What is the effect of that? Well, the rumor that we're going to see here in just a moment is spread. Everybody who handles that letter reads it, reads that rumor. What are they going to do with that information? Well, they're going to talk with the people that they know. This is very intentional on the part of Sanballat. He is intending that the rumor here 
that he is supposedly counseling Nehemiah about is going to be spread further and further. Verse 6 describes the rumor, and really it's Sanballat's rumor. He doesn't own the rumor, but it comes from him. And that rumor is that Nehemiah and the Jews are rebuilding the wall because they plan to to rebel once they've finished the wall around Jerusalem. Verse 7 adds the accusation that Nehemiah plans to be named as their king and and that he's even bringing in prophets into Jerusalem who are going to proclaim him as a king. Now, Now these are playing to what Sanballat knew were the messianic hopes of the Jewish people. That that the Jews expected, as was promised by the Old Testament prophets, that God would raise up another king, a Messiah king, a king in the line of David. And we don't know that that Nehemiah was in the Davidic line, but he probably was not, but that's the rumor that Sanballat is, or that's the hope that Sanballat is trying to play on in building this rumor. So like all rumors, what this rumor does is it, it misconstrues information and it misinterprets motives. It puts something into the heart of Nehemiah that clearly wasn't there. It takes the few facts that are known and twists them and puts a spin on them in a way that gives the worst possible light to what is actually happening. That's the effect of a rumor Uh, In your life, that's the effect of rumors in in the church here, that rumors take the few things that are known, they assume motives. In fact, when I I counsel people in conflict situations, the phrase I use is, don't commit a suicide. Don't assume motives. Don't assume that you know why the person did that. Don't you assume that you know what's in their heart. That's committing a suicide. Rumors do that. They assume motives motives. They assume actually the worst possible motives. I don't know why that is, but that's our human nature. If something is unknown, we're not sure why someone does that, somehow our mind goes to the worst possible answer to that. So Sanballat gives a warning. He says, you know, this this report, it's going to get back to the king. And, And the threat there is that the king of Persia, Artaxerxes, who Nehemiah had been the cupbearer, the trusted servant, Artaxerxes, will hear this rumor. He will assume that Nehemiah, his trusted servant, has has, uh, betrayed him, and it will be high treason. It will be considered high treason, and King Artaxerxes will have Nehemiah killed and will have Jerusalem uh, destroyed, uh, all the building that has happened destroyed. Well, so he, he then he invites them, again, trying to lure him out. Come, you know, come out and have a conversation with me. I'm sure we can figure a way to make this, to put this all right. Again, it's just a ruse to try to lure Nehemiah away to leave, uh, to, to leave Jerusalem. Nehemiah flatly denies the charge in verse 8. There's no truth in any part of the story. You're making up the whole thing. And of course, we're told in verse 9 that he discerns, he knows what their real motives are. They were just trying to intimidate me to stop the work on the wall. Nehemiah, I'm sure his anxiety had been raised by all this, but he he rejects their misinterpretation of his motives. He, He rejects their misrepresentation of his actions. He continues to do, he stays on the wall, he continues to do what he knows that God has called him to do. You know, and again, our enemy, if our enemy can't distract and divert you from your work on the wall, from your place and your sphere of influence where God has put you to make disciples, if he can't distract or divert you, this is another tactic that he will use. He will use rumor, he will use gossip and slander to try to take you out. He'll, he'll use other people and their misunderstanding maybe of what you're doing and why you're doing it, their misinterpretation of your motives. How often have you heard Sanballat's words in verse 6? There is a rumor. You know, maybe you heard it like this. You know, people are talking about what you're doing. People are talking about that, that what you did in that, that setting. There is a rumor. Or how often have you heard that, that you are planning to you know, that, that they go from that, that talking to 
this is our assumption about what you're doing. You're doing this because you intend to, and they fill in the blank in a way that totally assumes your heart and your motive. And invariably, they assume the worst motives, and that is why, using Sanballat's words there. Nehemiah models that this not only happens to us, but he models for us the way uh, to respond, and that is simply to keep doing what you're called to do. He doesn't stop working on the wall. He focuses on what God, he knows, has called him to do, and he trusts God. He trusts God with his reputation. He trusts God that he can't control what people are saying, but that God is going to take him through. He trusts God. That's the model for us. You know, gossip, it happens not only uh, in, in groups of people outside the church and what they are saying, it, it happens sadly inside the church. It's, it's one of the most insidious things. It's, it's one of the things that causes cracks in the foundation, the relational, the unity foundation of a church is where rumors get passed. Stephen Cole says it like this, and he's speaking about what can happen in churches. A rumor can easily be launched with one gossip, and when it's launched, it will spread like a virus from person to person, growing more malicious as it travels. Invariably, such rumors attack the character and the motives of godly leaders. And can we just all resolve that we don't want the unity of our church to be cracked with gossip and rumors? Can we just all resolve that that's not what we're, that's, we're, we're not going to do that? Just as we resolve that we don't want to pass a virus to someone else, we resolve that we are not going to pass rumors. We're not going to pass gossip. And if we hear something about a particular leader or a particular servant, a person who's serving, and, and, and we don't have all the information, we're going to go to that person, and we're going to ask them directly rather than engaging with them or communicating uh, you know, in a chain through other people. Well, finally, the last way that we see here in the text today that, that, uh, that the enemy tries to take Nehemiah out and tries to take us out is through anxiety and fear. We see this in verse 10 that Shemaiah calls Nehemiah to meet with him in his home. Uh, Shemaiah, we don't know a lot about him other than that he is somehow regarded in this community as a prophet, somebody who is able to declare the will of God. We're not sure totally what it means that he was confined to his home. Maybe he was disabled. Maybe he was ill. Maybe it was just a prophetic, uh, symbolic act, just like Jeremiah lying on his side. We're, we're not really sure, but what's interesting is this, the, this is the one time that Nehemiah left the wall, just briefly, but he left the wall. Shemaiah must have known that. If I can get Nehemiah to come off the wall there, Will that cause people to doubt him? Will that cause people to wonder if, if, if really Nehemiah has doubts about what they're doing? So, so maybe there was an attempt to discredit him even in that, but here's his main ploy. He tries to scare Nehemiah into thinking that assassins were coming to kill him. And so he, he proposes a solution. If, if assassins are after you, you know, find a safe room. Where's the safe room in Jerusalem? It's the inner sanctum the holy place or the holy of holies in the temple. That's where you could really lock yourself in. Well, Nehemiah in verse 11 responds appropriately. How can I enter the temple and live? Nehemiah knows what God's word says. In God's word, the Mosaic law says that if you are not a priest, you cannot enter the holy place. You cannot enter that inner sanctum of the temple. Remember what happened to King Uzziah in 2 Chronicles, I think it's 26. King Uzziah, not a priest. King Uzziah decides to enter into the holy place and actually offer incense. God strikes him with leprosy and judgment. Nehemiah knows that what this prophet, really this false prophet, is asking him to do is to, out of his fear, reacting in fear, to violate God's word. And he says, no, I, I won't do it. I'm not going to violate God's word. I'm not going to let my fear drive me to sin. As well as he says, should someone in my position run from danger? He's the governor. He's the leader of this project. Can you imagine the demoralizing effect, the, the discrediting effect upon his leadership? 
If Nehemiah had taken Shemaiah's advice and, and run and hid, leaving everybody else exposed? Well, verse 12, Nehemiah discerns that Shemaiah was a false prophet, that he was actually hired by Tobiah and Sanballat to utter his prophecy against them. Verse 13 gives us their motives. They were hoping to intimidate him and to make him sin. And again, bring this back to us today as you are on the wall and whatever assignment that God has given to you, uh, what is it that stirs up your anxiety and your fear? Because if the enemy can stir you up anxiously, if he can get you to the place where you are fearful and in that fear you consider doing things that are outside of the will of God to protect yourself, to defend yourself in some way, he can discredit you. He can discredit you. He can take you off the wall by discrediting you. So, so just think through these questions. Where, um, where are you most easily tempted to sin? Especially when you're intimidated. Especially when there is a threat of some form in your life or to something that is, or someone that is precious to you. Where does that tend to tempt you into sin? Uh, the, this pattern that, that, that is being presented in Nehemiah is a pattern that, that we're all presented with, um, that, that our, our fear drives us to look for a way out. You know, how, how, do I, how, do I, how do I get away from this thing that is a threat to me? And in that fear and in the, the lack of clarity of mind that we have in the midst of our fear, we tend to look for solutions that don't necessarily line up with God's word. And if we let that fear drive us, if, if we do not trust God and, and come before him and say, I'm going to trust you to take care of me in the midst of this, we are inclined to make sinful choices out of, an, out of our fear. And in doing so, we are discredited, we're, we're taken off the wall. And, and then what happens? Well, even what, what uh, Nehemiah says would, would have happened here, then they would have been able to accuse me and discredit me. We, in our fear, we make a choice that's outside of God's word, what is the enemy who's been tempting us to do uh, that do? He turns right around and he begins to accuse us. How can you serve the Lord when you have done this? Uh, he turns right around and accuses us and shows us or tells us that we are discredited. The enemy wants you off the wall. He does not want you in your marriage to be making a disciple out of your spouse. He does not want you as parents to be discipling your children. He does not want you serving in this church. He does not want you blessing your neighbors and building relationships where you can introduce them to Jesus Christ. He wants you off the wall. And he will do anything that it takes. He will try to discredit and divert you. And if that doesn't work, he will stir up gossip and slander against you. And if that doesn't work, he will try to intimidate and scare you. So how was it that Nehemiah was able to persevere? Was it just that he is this superhuman being? No, we are told that he was able to lead this project, completing the rebuilding of the wall in just 52 days because, verse 16, this was accomplished with the help of our God. That's who we should aspire to be. Not people who we can do what's before us because we have the capabilities in ourselves. No, we want to be people who do things because God is helping us. We want to be people who do things, who make disciples in a way that it can only be explained that it's, it's happening because God is helping us. Let me close with one thing. This is really a lead-in to the Lord's Supper, which we're going to celebrate in just a moment. Again here we see Nehemiah point us to Christ. And I go back to that key verse, verse 3. I am engaged in a great work, so I can't come down. Think of how that points us to what our Savior has done for us. You know, when Jesus was hanging on the cross, dying for you and me for our sin, he didn't actually speak these words, but he could have, couldn't he? You know, there were people who were hurling accusations at him. If you are the Son of God, prove it. Come down from the cross. Come down from the cross if you're really who you say you are. Now, he chose not to speak. 
but he could have spoken these words. I am engaged in a great work. I am dying in your place. I am dying so that my righteous blood covers your sin. And I can't come down. I I can't get off the cross. I can't save my human life. Because to do so would be to forfeit. I would no longer be the substitutionary sacrifice for you. As the writer of Hebrews said, he endured the cross, despising the shame. He completed the great work. He finished the great work. He did not come down from the cross so that he could complete that work for you and for me. And that's what we're going to celebrate now at the Lord's table. Let me pray briefly. We will sing, and then we'll come to the Lord's table. Lord Jesus, as we approach your table and these tangible symbols of what you have done, I I just pray you lay that before us. This is exactly what you did on the cross. You were completing the greatest work that has ever been done. And in doing so, you could have come down. You could have saved your life. You could have called legions of angels to rescue you. But you chose not to out of your great love for us so you could finish the work, this great work. Lord, bring us to your table that we may observe and celebrate that now. Amen.